On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Maura is 5 foot 7 inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Maura's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family at Direct at gmail.com, or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Maura Murray. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing really well. I'm excited about this episode. It's been uh, a long time coming. I can't wait to hear what people think about it. Me too. This was a search that we went on back in October of 2020 for private investigations for the missing. And we were joined by Greg Overacker, the private investigator and former bounty hunter and overall general badass who uh, works on Brianna Maitland's case, among many other cases. He joined us on this search because he is leading the case of Erica Franilich, who is a missing person out of Middleburg, New York. He is leading that investigation for our nonprofit, Private Investigations for the Missing. That's right. Erica went missing on October 13, 1986. She was 26 years old, 5 foot 4 inches, 100 pounds. She is a white female. Her disappearance has taken us, along with Greg, to this area where there are numerous caves. There was some talk that there might be something of interest in one of these caves, and Greg introduced us to a woman named Emily Davis, who is a professional caver and led an incredible crew and really guided us through the process of going into these extremely claustrophobic tight spaces and digging up from the bottom surface of the cave everything that's been down there for decades. And we didn't actually go into these crevices, which was uh, lucky for us. This uh, this cave was kind of like a hole in the ground, and it goes down about 30 feet. And so uh, Emily's crew sort of navigated their way down there. It's really quite impressive how this entire search came together all in the name of trying to help missing person Erica Franilich. And while the items that were brought up from the bottom of the cave may or may not have anything to do with Erica's disappearance, the fact that we were there performing this this operation, that, that we were actually taking charge of this investigation uh, behind Greg Overacker really speaks volumes of PIs for the Missing. Absolutely. PIs for the Missing is a nonprofit that we're on the board of, and it was founded by Bruce Maitland, missing person Brianna Maitland's father. And so this vision of his is kind of coming together. You can check out the site at investigationsforthemissing.org. Make sure to follow the social pages as well because they send out a lot of updates, and it's great stuff, great material. There's also a blog on the site. And it's a great resource for family, friends, anyone with a loved one who went missing and is currently still missing, and they really need to have a, a licensed, experienced private investigator help them out in their search. And we want to give a big thanks to Emily Davis and her crew, and they are all named in this episode. And you can check out Emily Davis's bookstore. It's speliobooks.com, and there is a link in the show notes. It is a uh, an online bookstore about caves, really, mostly. And we get into Emily's background a bit deeper near the end of this episode. I just want to let people know, and uh, we want to give a, a thanks to Fox TV from 1992, a video done by Robert Crumley. It's called Code 3 with Gil Gerard, and we, we did use a, a clip from that. It's the Emily Davis Mobley Rescue from April. April of 1991, Cave Rescue in Lechagia Cave. And uh, it's quite it's quite a, remarkable. So you'll want to listen to that at the end of the episode. And anyone with information regarding Erica's disappearance, 
please call the New York State Police at 518-630-1700. Or if you prefer to message Private Investigations for the Missing, the email address is investigationsforthemissing at gmail.com. That's all one word, investigationsforthemissing at gmail.com. Welcome to the podcast, Greg Overacker. How are you today, Greg? Good. How are you guys? Doing really well. Um, I'm really reassured that you're wearing your Batman t-shirt. That is symbolic for a couple of reasons. Uh, You are a superhero, A. And B, uh, we recently explored some caves, uh, the three of us, plus a very competent crew. So uh, you are now, um, I guess you're officially like half man, half bat. That's right. (laughs) Before we discuss this search that we went on in October of 2020, why was this area of interest? Erica Franlis went missing October 13th, 1986, in this area, very close to this area. After all these years, once the podcast started coming out, we started getting tips. One of her husband Richard's family members came forward, specifically asked us to search this spot. We had no other reason to search it. We never would have found, we never even known it existed. The area is littered with caves, it's heavily wooded. What they said was, this, this wasn't a search for Erica herself. They just said, we want you to search the spot for evidence, for our peace of mind. So that's, we were just looking for anything man-made in this particular area. Okay. And this was uh, done during a time where, you know, we were social distancing. It was a bit of a risk to go out and do it just in general. What was it about that area that made her family think that this was something that had to do with her disappearance? What is it about the area in general? I I can't really get into the specifics, but it was something they were all familiar with. But there's a number of caves there. There is, yeah. This cave, by the way, I just want to point out, was uh, less of a cave and more of just like a hole in the ground. That's a great point because people think cave and they think going into like the side of a, a hill or a mountain or something that goes up. This is this was literally a hole. And like uh, what Greg said, it was lined on the walls going down uh, with railroad ties so that it, it almost had like um, sort of grips or something that you could use to hold up the earth ar- around it. Probably the first four, four or five feet, right? It was a thirty-one. It was it's a thirty-one foot vertical shaft, and then it went over, and then it went through a crevice, and then there's another room, which is the other room they didn't get into. And how did they know it was thirty-one feet? That was part of the diagram that I had. That was that was drawn by the landowner. I think his name was Gage, but he had it all sketched out, and they measured the distance and everything. It was thirty-one feet deep. Yeah. Emily, who comes with us and is in charge of the crew of cavers, she moved there from the Boston area specifically for the caving. So that'll give you an idea of of the fact that there's so many caves there. And like we talked about before, there's Howe Caverns, which is a tourist destination. So when you walk through the woods, literally, you can stumble upon caves. And this was one of them. We needed them, of course, because we couldn't get down into it. And uh, I'd like to read their names here real quick. Emily Davis. She's the one we've been discussing mostly. There's Michael Martusello, Stacy Faunus, Eric Neiman, Peter Haberland, and Bob Hayden. And here we're talking to Emily about the cave and about what we're looking for. This is pretty controlled, and and the gear that we have is high safety gear, um, and we know what we need and what we want and yep. how we're going to do it. Uh, is is there a chance that a um, one of the uh, Handles on one of the buckets could break and a bucket could fall. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, when they're when we're hauling buckets, we're going to have the guys who are at the bottom stand against the walls. Right. So that they're not directly below a bucket. And I'm having the buckets filled halfway. Okay, and the buckets are going to be filled with... Um, soil. Soil that's at the bottom. At the and, bottom. Yeah, and Greg, what are we looking for in the soil? Anything man-made, anything that's not natural. We don't really know what we're looking for. Buttons, yeah. zippers, human gotcha. bones, anything. And we may get down, you know, the four or five inches of fallen, 
fallen leaves and, and trees and find that that we are at rock and that's the end. That's it, yeah. I mean, this may be a short story. Yeah. Uh, we also may dig down, you know, two feet and find nothing except rocks and soil. Yeah. We don't know, but for Greg's needs, we have to, we have to at least check this out. Mm -hmm. And checking this out without um, a team of experienced cavers would be, uh, I think, a bit of a challenge. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd jump in there. I would go down there. With, we, yeah. We've had yeah. to hold them back, actually. Yeah, I, I, yeah, no problem. See? Yeah, I, I mean, just let me do it, guys. Just let me do it. I, I, got, a, I got a climbing rig oh, I can put I it on you. Freestyle. Go, go I have freestyle. I freestyle, yeah. yeah. So most people don't seek this cave out, obviously. No, because no, it's not, it's, it, it doesn't lend itself to uh, recreation or exploration either. So you haven't been in this one in about 20 years? 20, 25 years. Um, and do they change? Well, this one's going to change a certain amount. If you look at around the entrance, you've got leaves and dirt and trees, and a lot of that stuff may fall in. Mm -hmm. So you end up with decomposition of um, biological material on the surface. And so you may get two or three or four inches of uh, soil from rotting material. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's not going to change a whole heck of a lot. Okay. Um, this cave was dug in the 1950s. There was a hole in the woods. And there's actually, you can go over and, and take a look over there. There's another hole in the woods. And when you see those sort of sinkholes that water flows into, it tells us that there's underground drainage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in this area where you have glaciation, the glaciers came through here. They, they filled in caves that were formed before the glaciers. And cavers, one of the things cavers do is dig in places where water goes underground or comes to the surface because that water has to transport somehow. Mm -hmm. And there may be tunnels that we can fit through. So we'll go out in the woods and find these holes in the woods and spend two or three years digging in the bottom of the hole to see if we can find a cave at the bottom. <laughs> it's one of the things we do for fun. Cave explorers are um, a little different. Well, you're certainly not claustrophobic. Uh, no, no, we can't be. <laughs> right. And in fact, one of the places that um, Eric, who's one of our team members, because he's the smallest of all of, all of us these days, uh, I think he may be the youngest here as well. Uh, I, I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, although he's not young, he's the youngest. Um, he will prob probably try and fit through. There's a, a crack that only one member of our team got through when I went in here 25 years ago. Yeah. He may try and go through that crack to see whether or not there's soil or anything on the other side of that crack. How big are these cracks? Like, well, this particular his... crack is probably only about eight inches, eight to nine inches wide. So it's sort of like that, but it's not even in smooth. Right. So you can slide down in it. You can get jammed in it. Um, and cavers who are experienced learn how to wiggle just right to get through. I mean, I can fit through eight inches. I don't look like I can fit through eight inches, but I can fit through eight inches. Well, we, we gave the GoPro to one of the guys, one of her team members who came up and they hadn't found anything. So what they were doing was pulling up debris and pulling up trash. It, it, it ended up to almost resemble like a trash pit, but more more like maybe some some washout trash or something. There was dirty diapers that they were pulling up, and uh, we'll we'll get into how they uh, put a time and a date on on the trash. But one of her team members at the end of the day was like, you know what? It's bugging me because there's this like crevice in the wall. It's like seven or eight inches thick. It it kind of goes down into a point. It's sort of like cone shaped, but it led to an area that was uh, it opened up into like a dome. So it was sort of another cave. Uh, on the other side of this rock wall and he was like I'm gonna go down there and try to see if I can get through and he took off his uniform to do it because that that made him uh, smaller to get through and and we sent the GoPro down with him and the footage is like I can't breathe watching the footage it's insane that's the thing it, you know it's shaped like this and he said gravity will bring you down into it and then you can't move 
Right. That's exactly why he came back up. He said the only way that you'd get something like a body through there is if you were to dismember it and really push it through. Um, and he uh, said how far he got in. I don't know how far exactly he got in, but he got in far enough where he realized if he slipped, he would have fell into the narrow part of that crevice and he wouldn't have been able to come out. And uh, that's when he backed up. He had said it's going to, he said, I, I can do, I can maybe get in there, but uh, there's a chance this will turn from a search to a, to a rescue. <laughs> oh my God. It's, it's pretty amazing that they brought this crew, all very nice people. And we got a chance to speak with each one of them, at, you know, given times or whatever. But remember they had one guy who was tying up these ropes to put the pulleys on and he knew exactly what he was doing. And they were talking back and forth and, and they had a way of speaking to each other so that they, you know, they made sure each one answered and all that stuff. Yeah, I was shocked at how much debris was around the cave. I was shocked that, you know, when you, when you use a metal detector and you go around outside, you find debris. I just, where's all this debris come from? Why is this all here? You know, it's been there accumulated over years and years and years and years. And then when you get down in, the fact that when they they started removing the floor and bringing up pieces of the floor, by the way, when I'm sifting, if we had been looking for Erica, herself it would have been treated a lot differently but since we were looking for in the ground was really wet since we were just looking for anything man-made an item kind of just did it as quick as we could because it was so wet but they kept going down stripping the ground stripping the ground and then when they get down to garbage i'm like garbage but one of the cavers also explained to me that with flooding and flows and stuff like that, that the garbage stuff like that will go to the cave and end up there and be there permanently. He could explain it a lot better. It kind of flows down there. Yeah, just the human imprint is everywhere. You, you think it wouldn't, it, the example is we're all standing there and you turn around and look, you know, what, not even a hundred yards and there's a car out in the middle of the woods. You know, it's a car from like the sixties, but you're like, what's that doing here? Yeah, car from the 60s with bullet holes in it. It might have been earlier than the 60s. When I saw it, I was like, that's from like the 40s. It looked like um, Bonnie and Clyde's car. So the cavers were able to put a bit of a time stamp on the cave, on the floor of the cave when they were pulling up the trash as an indication as to you know when to stop looking. They pulled up a glass Pepsi bottle and one of them looked up when the last time Pepsi made their uh, two liter bottles out of glass. And I think the year was 1978 that they said was uh, the last time those glass Pepsi bottles were in production. So that put where they were at, at least at 1978. Yeah, it was 78 or 80. Yeah. Right. But it was long enough where they knew if they dug any further, then you're going beyond 1978. Anything, any, anything after 1978, they would have pulled up already. Yeah. And she disappeared in 1986. Yeah, that was a little kind of ingenious of them, huh? We're searching yeah. for, like, they started searching for labels and then they found the bottle. And uh, again, I just, somebody that's not familiar with that, I just couldn't believe the human imprint that was there. So when I searched outside around the cave, around the mouth, I did that a, a couple of times on my own. I went up for a couple of days, nice, nice days. It was just nice to get outside if, you know, during this thing. It was nice to be up there with all you guys and, and actually be a little social. You know, I, I live alone. I was just like a shut in. But when I went up and searched around, I found all kinds of, of trinkets and stuff. I actually found a locket, some shells wire and different little artifacts but you think geez even just walking through the woods you'll find things you'll find bundles of uh barbed wire stuff like that some shells what do you mean shells turtle shells shotgun yeah it's interesting but you know you, you talk to the landowner too and they say look there's thousands of shells up here so you have to it would have to be something specific you know site site specific but um, people are hunting up there all the time. Just go up there to shoot. Like that car is just riddled with bullets. And when we were there, it was actually in the middle of bow season, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's why we weren't worried about being really loud. <laughs> no, I was, I was being intentionally very loud at some points. Yeah. Now, we weren't intending to find a body. To be clear on that, it was anything that was man-made, anything that might have been related to Erica, something like they 
they threw down there, maybe scattered it amongst the different caves, just anything that would put her there. Uh, and can you confirm or, or deny that anything was uh, was found? Was there anything that you're going to be looking at a little bit closer? Yeah, we have some items that we're looking at. Um, I've actually got to get them to Lou. It's nothing I can specifically say it has to do with her. Was there some significance to the actual date that we were there on the search? Oddly, you know, we didn't plan that. But that would have been 34 years to the day that we believe that Erica perished. So she went missing October 13th, 1986, but we believe she, she, we believe she was killed the 14th. So we were there on the 14th and that just kind of dawned on us, didn't it? Like the night before, I think it dawned on me, but yeah, odd that we wouldn't even plan it that way. No. And as a matter of fact, we had another date planned several weeks beforehand and we got rained out. So this was a, a selection of future dates that was put out there. And it was just kind of random that we all had that one day that we could uh, spare. How close was this area to where Erica went missing? I'd have to say it was probably a dozen miles, maybe 12, 14 miles, maybe where she was last seen, but where we believe she went missing from, it was probably two miles, not even maybe. And that's where we believe she, she went missing from. Gotcha. And where was she last seen? At the main rail bar, which is now a, a, like a coffee shop. What brought her back to the area about two miles from where we searched? That was the where the Franlick home was. Uh, and we believe she made it back there. On her own? They left the bar. No, we believe her and a group of people left the bar and made it back to the Franlick home. Yeah. Hmm. The bar The bar was closed, and I think it was 87. I could be wrong. But it's uh, on the corner of Railroad Street and Main Street and Middleburg. Middleburg's a very attractive little town, isn't it? Very quaint. Yeah. It was quaint and cute, yeah, and uh, great foliage. Yep. A very scenic. You know, there's kind of little mountains around you. and Yeah. Interesting place. You, you head south of there, and you're going to – you kind of go into the abyss, state forest after state forest, and, you know, no real population to speak of for miles and miles and miles and miles. It's, it's a bizarre thing. Where I live – so you guys came in from the opposite direction – there's something called Route 20, U.S. Route 20. Once you cross over that, head into Schoharie County, it's a whole different world. Everything's different. The, the landscape just changes greatly. Did you uh, have any communication with Erica's family before we did the search? And did you have any communication with them after? Yeah, I stay in touch with her sister quite often. So she knew what was going on. And I've talked to her since. You know, I can't even imagine what this family's been through all these years. Parents passed away. She said brothers pass away. As a matter of fact, when I started this, the first person I got in contact with her was Erica's brother, Dana, uh, and he since passed away. And he was texting me. He was in pretty rough shape, but he was texting me and saying, you got to do this for me. You got to find her, you know, encouraging me and stuff like that right to the end. So Erica's disappearance really uh, took, a, took a lot out of him. Yeah, the whole family you know, over the years. And they've tried and tried and tried to get some peace over the whole thing. And uh, they're, they're happy we're on board, that's for sure. Absolutely. It's uh, one of the few cold cases that I personally feel like is one or two steps away from being solved. What's your, what's your opinion on that? Oh, it's absolutely solvable. Absolutely. And anyone that looks at it will tell you that professionally or not it's it was funny to talk to people that are professionally are involved you know even even the people that are removed from it but are familiar with it people that are long since retired i mean there's there's 34 years there's guys that are long since retired from this the guys that had the case for a very short time moved on had their police career and then retired they all say the same thing not a whodunit 
absolutely solvable. And because there was a huge gap in the investigation, I, I, this is my opinion. I think a lot of people would agree that there was some huge gaps years long where the case was just kind of dormant and just, he was given a pass on the whole thing that I, I dubbed her the forgotten girl because it was like people forgot about her. I mean, that was the whole thing we go into with, with Bruce and with Brianna and stuff like that too, is um, I think there's certain people that, I mean, professionally, I, I know they care and they, they want to solve it and all that other stuff. But I think sometimes we all need to be reminded that for every day that you don't do something, that you don't act or you aren't on the offensive, that someone is in great anguish. I mean, absolute anguish. And Bruce is suffering and, and, and it, they, he needs to know that people are out there working hard, you know? So when it went dormant like that for years, I mean, when, when I started getting in touch with Erica's sister, Nada, and she said, we haven't heard from the police since 2012 or 2013 because we just, they just forgot about us. They just, they moved on, you know, so they're heartbroken over that. And of course they will tell you different that they're working on it and stuff like that, but they just didn't contact the family. So I don't know. It's interesting that uh, it, it would probably just take one piece of evidence is to make a connection um to an individual that might be responsible or to an individual that might know something. And do you believe that this one piece of evidence is still out there in one of those caves around the area that we searched? Do you think if we went back there two more times, three more times, took Emily and her crew, if we kept going into those caves, do you think that we would find something eventually? I'm not so certain about the caves. I've got a few specific areas that I think are extremely important. I'm not the only one that feels that way. I think that's a common knowledge at some point I mean, it would take it would take a lot of searching but i think at some point it will be searched i think that uh well i know for a fact that there are people out there that have the answers same thing as brianna's case i think there's people who can come forward and put an end to this tomorrow i well, i know there is i know her i know his family could they could come forward and, and but they, they won't do that what would it take to get a search warrant to go on to one of these properties that you think there might be some evidence? That I don't know. It's a better question for Lou. And you said his family. Who? Who is that? You mean uh, Eric, Richard, Erica's uh, husband at the time of her disappearance? Yeah, they have the answers. Some of them. Not all of them. What needs to happen next for this case to get solved? Well, there are people that could come forward. There are people out there in the public that have answers. Absolutely. Without a doubt, not even a question. That could happen. Family members could come forward. That could happen. A search could be fruitful. That could happen. So we're going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So like the same with Brianna's case, we talk about this a lot during that, is that our information as private investigators go to the police 100% of it at some point. Very little, sometimes none, comes back. And that's okay. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it works for a lot of different reasons. So we're okay with that. But we do know for, through our work, and, and then I'm sure they're, they're very aware, that there are people out there that have the answers. It kind of hurts you as a human being to know that people have these answers and they don't come forward. I don't know what kind of a shitty person you have to be, <laughs> but it's a fact. And, and, and the, just the fact that it happened, you know, we deal with it in Brianna's case and then we deal with it in Erica's case, it shows you that it's not that unusual. If someone were to come forward because they heard about the searching that's going on and, you know, the independent searching, uh, your work with uh, law enforcement in the area, uh, if someone were to come forward, would that be enough to warrant uh, getting uh, permission to search, like to get a search warrant? Is that enough? That's, that's a good question for Lou. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean any anyone could come forward and say, "Listen, I saw I saw this happen on this night. I saw exactly where they dumped the, a body. I'm 100% sure." Like where where do we go from there? Are they coming to you or are they coming to law enforcement or are they <laughs> emailing uh, you know, us at crawl space? Well, hopefully eventually that would get to law enforcement. A lot of the property around there now, it, you know, it would be a matter of getting just permission because it's no longer owned by the family. I mean, there was a there was a large swath of property that was owned by the family that just isn't anymore. So maybe that would be an option. And how much of the original property does the family now own? 
So the original property was 102 or 110 acres, I think. When the father passed away, the property was broken up. So the original homestead is still there on a piece of property, but uh, uh, two thirds of the property is now in, uh, under other ownership. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know as far as searches and stuff like that. I have, yeah, that's a police matter. That's something that they deal with as far as that goes. So do we have any other plans to get together with Emily and uh, check out any, uh, any other location that might be uh, too claustrophobic for regular humans like us to explore? <laughs> Not just yet, but you know what? It's nice to know that they would, they would help us out. They were just a great crew, weren't they? They were there. They were happy to be there and help. They um, explained stuff to us if we needed to know anything. They asked us some questions. And they, they did a great job. Got their hands dirty, that's for sure. Tell us a little bit about Emily and her crew and how you met them and a little bit about her past as well. So oddly, this family member takes me to, wants to take me to this area. And uh, so I go to the property to see if I can get permission from the landowner to get on the property. And very nice people. As a matter of fact, he and I were uh, emailing last night back and forth. As I'm leaving one day, his wife says, if you really want to know about the caves in this area, right around the corner, literally right up around the corner is uh, a woman who owns a an online and physical bookstore on caving has caved all over, literally all over the world <laughs> and just goes into all this stuff. Her, it's, it, she's an expert. So I drive up to her house and knock on her door. She's kind enough to come out and sit on the back porch with me. She, you know, we social distance or whatever. She talked to me for about an hour. She agreed to help. She's actually has a cave on her property or across the street from her property that she's kind of the caretaker of. There's a couple of, uh, conservancies that she's a member of. They kind of raise money and care for the properties and stuff like that. So we ended up getting further contact with her. So she brought a crew with her when the time came. You can look Emily Mobley up on YouTube if you want. And YouTube, you can actually physically see them in the caves and stuff like that. And there was an incident where she was in a cave. I think it was in Carlsbad or near Carlsbad. And she broke her leg and a boulder had fallen on her leg and it took them four days to get her out Four days. That's how deep she was in this cave. And they've got footage of guys with her on a stretcher pulling her up. So some of the, the landings are going to her 250 feet. If you can imagine that it's, it was really cool, but they were fantastic. They showed up, they did a great job. Pretty interesting people. How do you even figure out your, you enjoy this? Like, how do you figure out that? Because how, how many people do you know when you walk into a room of your friends who can say, I have been places where no other human being on the face of the earth has been? If I ask that question in a room full of my friends, yeah. probably 90% of them will raise their hand. Yeah. So, so you put I, yourself in a unique crowd. You are, you are in a group of people who have made a decision that um, that exploring is one of the most important things they've ever done. Yeah. Um, exploring is uh, a challenge, both physically and mentally. Their financial life may be, may be tied to the fact that they are going to, um, they're going to give up certain financial uh, comforts. comforts. Yeah. But they are going to be able to say at the end of their life, um, I have explored things that, that few people or no people on have Earth seen, yeah. have ever seen. Um, I know that Peter and I have been in a cave called Lechaguilla in New Mexico together. We have both seen enormous amounts of, of cave passage that either nobody or 10 people have ever seen and may never see again. Those people may never, no one may ever go in that passage again. Yeah. I mean, there's one passage I mapped in that cave that I truly doubt anyone will ever go in again. Really? And you mapped it? So that yeah. you took like the... Um... With, with the team that I was with mapped it. Yeah. It's all teamwork. And that's right. the other thing is uh, certain sports are individual sports. Um, and people think of caving as, as individualistic, but it actually is not. We yeah. rely on each other literally for our lives. Oh, yeah. Literally.
yeah, it's kind of shocking that she puts uh, herself at, at risk um, for that. I, I can't relate to that. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. And it, she's, she's such an interesting person to listen to. Just just listen to her talk about the things that she's done and the places she's gone and the people she's met. I got to ask you, and I'm going to make sure that the guys see. So when you broke your leg in the cave, that was in where? That was in Lechaguilla Cave in on the Carlsbad Caverns property in New Mexico. How'd you break your leg? I was mapping an, an unmapped passage and a handhold that I grabbed onto popped loose and rolled down and hit me in the knee. So the handhold broke? So I was, it was a sloping passage like this yeah. and I was climbing back up and it was maybe 15 feet and then up through a hole in the floor and I had gone down to see if it, it went on. We were in unmapped passage and when I climbed down, it was fine. And when I climbed up, I reached up and grabbed hold of a rock that popped loose. Oh. And I slid backwards and the rock came down and hit me in the knee. I broke your knee, broke your um, leg. Broke tibial plateau fracture, which is, you know, the bone, chicken bones, you know, they're like yeah. that and you got the kneecap over it. So that's the plateau right there. The rock hit the side of it and smashed it. More than 150 men and women joined the rescue effort. 40 of those will risk their lives going underground. At 1,565 feet, Lechuguilla is the nation's deepest cavern. Its cave system stretches nearly 55 miles. The rescue team must reach the victim and bring her out as quickly and safely as possible without damaging Lechuguilla's priceless natural resources. Four days it took him to get you out Four and of a half. How, yeah. far, how yeah. deep in the cave were you? A thousand feet down and a mile and a half back. You were a thousand feet in the ground? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot Took of it four was days rope, to get her out. Rope work, a lot of rope work. And you were with other people, I assume, and they. Oh yeah, to get we had help. a team. Of, yeah, we had a team, and and uh, a couple of them went. Uh, we sent one of them who was out to notify, and he he ran into um, another group that had a very fast caver in it. He went out, went back to the park service, and notified them. And you were there for four days. No, we started carry out within 24 hours. Uh huh. So. So does that make your mind get goofy from being in the cave out? No sunlight. No, we've we, we've been underground for four days, five days. That's not a. In a row. Yeah. Yeah. So you just camp out and sleep in there. And... Yeah. 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 When we're mapping, you have to go way back in the cave. And... So when you map, do you do you leave your debris and then get it on the way back? Um, or do you not know if you're going to come out that way? You, there are certain camp spots, and those camp spots have urine drops okay. that you can leave some urine in a very specific place in the cave. Oh. Um, and then solid wastes you may leave in, a, in that area while you're camping and while you're out every day doing survey work, but you pick up the solid wastes and carry it out with you. Holy crap. In your four days down into a hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, there have been people. Who... You, you were probably in incredible pain, right? No, we had we had drugs. <laughs> <laughs> One of the guys had um, had just had an appendix out, oh. so he had some uh, some Darvaset with him, um, and then we had some um, uh, we had some stronger drugs sent in. We never used the morphine. I mean, one of the people on my team was emergency room doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so he could have used injectable morphine if we needed it, but I never needed it. Yeah, yeah, wow. Um, so I saw him with you on the stretcher taking you off. Oh, the video. Yeah, the yeah. hall. The hall. How, many, how many feet yeah. up was that? Well, there's, there, there were three different major drops. One of them was 250 feet. One of them was 155 feet, and one of them's 90 feet. Wow, that's a lot of ways. To that is a long way up. Yeah, to hoist somebody <laughs> well, up. Well, I mean, it, it, you use, you you use pulley it. systems and... Yeah. The rescue operation is now in its fourth grueling day. The team faces its last and most challenging vertical ascent. Yes. You trust the people you're with. You have to have trust in them. Um, you're trusting your life to them. And you have to make a commitment to them as well. 
it's a it's a almost a barter system of um, goodwill and caring. After nearly a hundred exhausting hours in the hands of her fellow cavers, Emily Davis Mobley once again sees the bright stars in the clear New Mexico sky. And she's a leader too. Just being around her, you saw how she could lead her crew, and she instilled a lot of confidence in them. They were willing to go do things uh, that. Like Tim said, we have no desire to do these things. You have no desire to do this. It's extremely claustrophobic. Even if you don't have claustrophobia, it's you. You'd get it. You know, if you're if you're not, if you've never done that before, you drop down there six feet and think that you were five hundred feet in the earth and and in a in a tomb. You know, just listening to the stories uh, of going down there and and going through an eight inch crevice uh, got me claustrophobic. I didn't even want to listen to them. <laughs> 